Today on the Perception in Action podcast, how do we coordinate movement across our different body segments and with respect to the external environment? A look at a specific example of a coordinated structure in baseball batting. So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to revisit the topic of coordinated structures, which I first introduced back in episode 95 when talking about extensions of Bernstein's work. To refresh your memory, a coordinated structure, which was first proposed by Turvey and colleagues, is a linkage between body segments such that they are constrained to act as one functional unit. It is a means of solving the degrees of freedom problem, or taking advantage of motor abundance, depending on your perspective. Coordinated structures simplify the complexity of movement by writing an equation of constraint which applies to a set of muscles and joints, thus treating them as a single unit. In essence, this creates an autonomous, self-regulatory mechanism. As long as the constraint is met, the system organizes itself within. In this view, Motor learning is discovering the right kinds of constraints over separate parts of the body to achieve the goal action. For each system, there are a set of coordinative structures that are more stable, and thus are more likely to naturally emerge, than others. So in a nutshell, coordinative structures are rules which constrain a set of muscles and joints and movements, some of which are due to the intrinsic dynamics of our body, others of which must be discovered through problem solving and practice. So, that's the general definition. In today's episode, I want to try to further our understanding of this concept by giving a specific example. The paper I want to look at today was one published by Katsumata in Human Movement Science in 2007. It looks at a coordinative structure in baseball batting. As I discussed in the opening of today's episode, coordination across the activities of our different body segments is essential to mastering the degrees of freedom and movement. But it is of course also critical that we coordinate these bodily movements with respect to the external environment. Put another way, quote, a coordinated structure that meets the requirement of a given motor task is shaped by the confluence of constraints, which are associated with an organism performing the motor task, an environment associated with the task situation, and the goal of the motor task and task conditions, unquote. So let's look at how this applies to baseball batting. In batting, the first task requirement is to organize movement across the multiple body segments to as to produce a force to create a powerful bat-ball contact. This is achieved by exploiting the ground reaction forces, that is, transferring force or momentum via a kinetic chain. When the batter begins the swing, they take a step with the front foot in the direction of the oncoming ball. This stepping motion serves the purpose of shifting the weight forward onto the front foot, which is then fixed onto the ground to allow for effective hip and upper body rotation. Obviously, to achieve maximum force, there must be proper coordination between the pattern of stepping and shifting the weight onto the front foot. For example, the initiation of the rotation of the hips needs to be coordinated with the timing of the shift in weight. But, the coordination of the hitting movement can not only be considered with respect to the timing of the different motor segments. The hitting motion, of course, also needs to be timed appropriately for the flight path of the pitch. For this, the batter faces two challenges. First is that they need to be able to adapt their movement effectively for a variety of different pitch types, for example fastballs, curveballs, sliders, etc., that can travel at very different speeds. The reorganization of the swing movement to deal with these different pitches could potentially disrupt the biomechanical linkage between stepping, the forward weight shift, and the swing of the bat resulting in a loss of power in the swing. The second issue is the very small time window in which the batter has to pick up perceptual information about the flight of the pitch to organize the swing motion. One way to deal with these challenges in hitting is to allow for functional variability in the swing movement. In other words, a movement error in a particular motion phase, for example the batter steps too early for an unexpected slow pitch, can be compensated for by subsequent motion phases for example by slightly delaying the shift in weight, leading to a progressive decrease in the movement error as the movement unfolds up to the moment of ball-back contact. To explore these processes, Katsumata asked six college baseball players from Japan to hit against a pitching machine. Vertical ground reaction forces were measured using two force plates mounted in the batter's box. 
There were two different pitch speeds, a 72 mile an hour quote unquote fast pitch and a 45 mile an hour slow pitch. Batters hit in three conditions, the mono slow condition in which all pitches were slow, a mono fast condition in which all pitches were fast, and a mixed condition in which pitch speed was chosen randomly. Obviously in the first two conditions, the batter can anticipate the speed and trajectory on every pitch and therefore could use a monotonic timing pattern whereas in the mixed condition they cannot. Initial analyses of the vertical ground reaction forces revealed that the hitting movement could be split into four distinct segments. The moment at which the front foot leaves the ground, called stepping, the moment at which the front foot touches back down to the ground, called landing, the time at which the force on the front foot begins to increase rapidly, indicating a weight shift, waiting, and the moment at which the bat began to move forward, called the swing. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, the timing of these different movement segments were measured both with respect to the ball release and with respect to the impact between the bat and the ball. Finally, the standard deviation of the timing of these different segments was calculated across all the participants in the study. So referring to last week's episode, we're talking about between trial variability here. What was found? The first main finding of the study was that some of the segments of the swing were modulated with respect to pitch speed, while others were not. For example, the time between waiting and the start of the swing was roughly the same for the different pitch speeds and conditions. In other words, once the weight shift is started, it unfolds with a consistent temporal pattern, and then the bat swing is initiated. This temporal association between the weight shift and the bat swing initiation seems to reflect the time required for ground reaction forces to be utilized via biomechanical links for generating hip and upper body rotation to produce a bat swing. From this mechanical viewpoint, weighting needs to be mutually coupled with the swing for effective transfer of force to the bat swing action. This means that the temporal pattern of weighting to swing should not be modulated to adjust for different speeds. In other words, due to the intrinsic dynamics of the batter, there are degrees of freedom in the movement that cannot be used to adapt to changes in the external environment. However, the timing of the landing relative to impact, which is later for slower pitches, and the duration of the swing, which is shorter for faster pitches, were modulated in the study. In particular, it seems as if the timing of the motion before the weight shift onto the front foot is critical for adapting to different pitch speeds. To further explore this aspect of the swing, Katsumata next looked at the timing of the different phases relative to the release of the ball. This analysis revealed that the timing of landing after release appeared to be nearly the same across task conditions regardless of the speed of pitches. However, the timing of the forward weight shift, the waiting phase, was modulated depending on the pitch's speed. In particular, for slow pitches, batters remain momentarily with their weight on the rear foot, delaying a bit the start of the weight shift to the front foot. Therefore, since the duration from waiting to swing was consistent across all of the speed pitching conditions, the timing modulation of the hitting movement with respect to slow or fast pitches seems to be occurring by adjusting the timing of waiting after the front foot has already contacted the ground. The next thing that was examined was the variability in the timing of the different swing segments. Consistent with the idea I mentioned earlier that a swing involves functional compensatory variability, the standard deviation progressively decreased as the movement unfolded from landing to impact. Thus, it is clear that a baseball swing is not a purely ballistic, pre-programmed action as some have proposed. It involves a continuous online regulation. Further to this point, the final sets of analyses looked at the correlation between the different movement phases. It should be expected that if the timing of an unfolding batting movement is modulated up to the impact, One movement phase, which occurs relatively early with respect to the oncoming pitch, can be compensated for by a relatively late timing of a subsequent movement phase, and vice versa. This should show up as a significant negative correlation between variables. This is exactly what was found. For example, the later the timing of landing after release occurred, the shorter duration of landing to swing phase, resulting in a correlation of negative 0.96. Interestingly, there was also a moderate negative correlation between the time of the start of the swing and the actual swing duration. This implies that the timing of the hitting movement can still be modulated even after the bat swing is initiated. However, this may be only possible for the relatively slow speeds used in the study. 
It was also found that the modification of movement from the swing to impact phase, so the swing itself, was less effective than within the landing to waiting to swing motion phases. Therefore, it seems as if the temporal organization of movement prior to the actual initiation of movement of the bat is what is of particular importance for adjusting to different pitch speeds in hitting. So in sum, this study provides strong evidence that the task requirement of baseball batting, producing a powerful swing that is timed relative to the flight of the pitch, is achieved through the use of a coordinative structure. The results demonstrated that the movement of hitting a baseball pitch is not monotonic, but is instead functionally flexible, so as to modulate the movement in the landing to waiting motion phase against different speeds of pitches. For timing the waiting phase with respect to the flights of slow and fast pitches, the stepping movement was modulated, such as after the front foot made contact with the ground, batters remained for a short moment and stayed back to wait for a slow pitch. When the batters knew the next pitch would always be slow in the case of the slow mono condition, they delayed the touchdown of the front foot on the ground. Thereby, they modulated the timing of waiting on the front foot. However, if pitch speed could not be anticipated, as was the case in the mixed pitch condition, the timing of landing was consistent for hitting slow and fast pitches, indicating that batters prepared the movement to hit fast pitches. Then, if the pitch was slow, they stayed back before initiating the waiting phase. Stated another way, even when the timing of landing was early with respect to the speed of the pitch, as is the case in the slow mix condition, they can modulate the timing of the movement by adjusting the timing of the waiting to the front foot to compensate for early landing. This modification in the patterning of the landing to waiting motion phase demonstrates the existence of a coordinated structure, such that the timing of the stepping motion and the forward weight shift are attuned to the speed of the pitch. Another characteristic of a coordinated structure is a functional compensation for achieving a task. This was also clearly demonstrated by the negative correlation between adjacent phases in the swing movement and the reduction in variability from initiation to the point of impact. Finally, these results also clearly indicate that visual information during the flight of the pitch is utilized to modulate the unfolding movement, and hitting the ball cannot be achieved just by executing a pre-programmed movement. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeuates. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.